All right, let's see here. We are getting ready for our Wednesday night gathering on Facebook Live. We just finished our connection in person, and uh, so looking forward to seeing who's going to join us online live tonight from wherever you might be. And so I'm um, looking that we've got three viewers from wherever you are, and I'm trying. Hey, Chris Kessler, I'm not surprised you're the first one here. So, Chris, good to see you, my friend. Glad to have you. We've got four other people in the room right now. I don't know who you are, but whenever you have a chance, there's Linda and Jerry and Kennedy. So glad to have the three Nadilskis here with us tonight. So that's good. Chris, tell your mom and dad I said hello. I've missed seeing your dad, but I look forward to seeing you and your mom on Sunday. So we have five people in the room now. So if you would just tell me who you are, I would greatly appreciate it. We're going to go through a Bible study tonight on the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. And so that's uh, going to be a... Hopefully we'll have a good time tonight doing this. Now we have eight people here who are joining us. Lisette, I'm so happy to see you. Good to see you, my friend. How'd your boys do for school getting started? How are they doing with school? How's Mason doing with school? Don and Edna Garrett from Gainesville. Nice to have you guys with us as well. And so good to see you. Lisette, keep me posted. Let me know. Hello, Ryda. Glad to have you with us tonight. Good to see you, my friend. Welcome back, and uh, I'm glad to have you here with us tonight. So it's good to good to see you folks. Hey, Joan. I've missed my friend Joan and Morgan, my buddy Morgan. So good to see you. Jennifer, so nice to see you with us. So Jennifer, I'm glad you're here tonight, and I, I hope you're feeling well. I hope treatments are going okay. So it's nice to see you. I haven't heard from your mom in quite a while. So, uh, so that would, yeah, so it's good to, good to hear from you, Jennifer. Good to see you. Outstanding, Liz. I'm very glad to hear that. Very glad to hear that. So that's, that's good news. Very cool. So we have about 12 people in the room, and uh, if you haven't checked in, I would love for you to check in for a quick minute. Just get us an idea of who's here so we can say hello and do all those good things, and that would be, uh, that would be awesome. So, Lisette, who, uh, who, what are the grades that the kids are in? Can you write down what grades they're all in? And so I would like to know how, what grades they're in. Ryda, I'm glad to see you too. It's good, to, it's good to be back. Charles, good to see you, bud. Thank you for joining with us, young man. Glad, glad you are here with us tonight. So that's a, that's a good thing. Let's see. Well, I've got 735, and I've got about 15 people in there. There's Liz. The sisters are here. My favorite back row Baptists are in the house. So, Liz, Elizabeth, I was asking uh, your sister about Mason. So I hope Mason had a good start to school, and uh, that's, uh, that's, that's good, I hope. So let's hear from that. Mary Alice, glad to see you. So glad to have you with us, Mary Alice. That's a nice fifth, third, and first. Wow, you're going to be busy merciful heavens that's some serious activity right there well i'm what grade is mason in what grade is mason is elizabeth karen wisdom good to see you my friend glad to have you back with us i've missed seeing you and so it's nice to have you with us this evening so karen glad to glad to see you i hope you're healing well from all the challenges you've had in recent recent weeks and months so it's good to good to see you and so mercy all right, guys. Well, uh, I've been out for the last two. Well, I've been out for the last six weeks and on a sabbatical, five weeks on a sabbatical. And there's Russell Tuck. Good to see you, my friend. Glad to see you, buddy. Good to have you with us. Elizabeth, that's awesome. Fourth grade. That's exciting stuff. Well, I am glad to be back. I had a wonderful sabbatical break, and it was just good for my heart and my soul and my mind. I uh, one of the things that, hey, Dwayne, good to see you from Evansville. Welcome back, buddy. Your mom just checked in, too, so it's good to have mom and son uh, with us tonight. Uh, thank you for the pictures, um, comment, but anyway, uh, I don't get a chance to read a lot of books while life is going on, like many of us, and it's really important for pastors to be reading, and so one of the things I was able to do while I was on sabbatical was read a lot, and I, I read an even dozen books. My goal was to read 20, and I got just a little bit more than 50% of that, but I got to read about a dozen books and uh, had a good time for that. Got to do a lot of climbing and hiking and biking, so I did some good adventure, and, and so it was, and I got to rest a lot. I, man, 
There were some nights that I would go to bed at 9 o'clock at night and, uh, Linda Nadilski, you're funny. Uh, there were some nights I could go to bed at 9 o'clock and, uh, and I'd sleep till 7 in the morning and it was, it was good just to get some good, good rest. So my sabbatical was, was good for my heart and my soul and my mind. And so I'm, I'm glad to be, glad to be back. But I did miss you guys. I did miss being a part of the church. I did miss seeing you and connecting with you. And that's, um, and so it's good to be back on Wednesday night and, Good to be back here on the line as well. Uh, if you have some prayer requests, I would great appreciate hearing those. You could write those down in the in the comment section. And if you have some things to be thankful for, that would be awesome as well. So we can uh, so we can hear about that. We have 17 people in the room right now. And if you haven't checked in, I would really appreciate it if you would uh, if you would just let me know who's here so we can uh, just have an idea of who all's in the room. A couple of prayer things. Uh, if you attend our nine o'clock service, one of the people that I always pick on in my sermons is Bill Burton. And Bill Burton is 85 years old, and Bill fell down a flight of stairs. Dizzy! Good to see, buddy! Glad you're with us. But my, my friend Bill Burton, he fell down a flight of stairs, and at 85 years old, that's not good. So I had the opportunity to go to see him in his rehab today, and Bill is in a lot of pain. He is, he is in a lot of pain. And uh, so I want to pray for Bill. Bill, Bill's blind. And, uh, and so while we were talking today, he, he couldn't even keep his eyes open, but he kept talking and engaging with me and whatnot. And I was there for about 40, 45 minutes. And, uh, and so please, please keep Bill in your prayers. When also had expected to see uh, Bill Dancy, and he had been discharged. So Bill Dancy has been discharged from, uh, hey, Helen, good to see you. And um, he had been discharged, so he's at home recovering. He had a bad break on his leg. And so uh, Bill Dancy, Bill Burton, keep those folks in your pray prayers. Um, I invite you to pray for um, James Hill. He's, uh, during our Bible study in person, his mom Kim said that he was getting ready for a job interview tomorrow. Big job interview, so we want to pray for James as he's doing, as he's doing that. Um, I, many of you have prayed for my friend Trevor Weaver. Uh, Trevor has joined us on Wednesday night Bible studies in the past, and uh, we have prayed for Trevor as he was battling brain cancer, and very early in my sabbatical, Trevor passed away, and uh, I'm going to fly back to Illinois to do his funeral in two weeks, going to fly out on a Friday and back on a Saturday, uh, but uh, Trevor, Trevor passed away, and we're going to be doing his funeral um, back in my hometown, so um, I had talked with you, Dwayne, about staying with you maybe, but it uh, looks like the funeral is going to be in West Frankfurt and not in Evansville. So, so I'd appreciate you praying for my, my friend's family as they deal with um, his, his passing. So that's a, that was tough. I, Trevor, Trevor was a longtime good friend. We, I could, I'm not going to tell you, but I could tell you some really good stories and some adventures we had. But, uh, wow, I'm going to miss, going to miss Trevor. He was a good dude. And uh, so that's that. What prayer requests do you have? What prayer requests do you have? I see Ryder's has got a friend who had thyroid surgery today. Any other prayer requests that you have? And what are some things you're thankful for? So let's kick them down. We've got 20 people in the room. So if you don't have a prayer request, share something you're thankful for. So if you would just take a moment and just share something you're thankful for, I would greatly appreciate that. There's 19 people in the room right now. So uh, share something you're thankful for or share a prayer request. I would greatly greatly appreciate that and I'm not going to say anything else until we start getting some comments there and let's see what happens I'm gonna take a drink of water see what happens all right it looks like nothing's happening because I don't know if my computer is moving slow or what the story is yes thank you Linda that was a good time and so and by the way if you want to see a really cool picture uh, I took a picture of a lighthouse in Canada and sent it to Linda and she painted it and go to Linda's Facebook page and you can see well not while I'm doing my Bible study but go to Linda's Facebook page and you can see something there Chris Kessler all right very good Chris good stuff thankful for your amazing family and kids that's excellent I like that thankful for your health I like that good word thankful for watching hey right I'm glad to see you thankful for that's a good one right there Dizzy I like that 
Oh, mercy. Elizabeth, I thought I saw something you posted and it popped off, so I, it, it dropped down there. But anyhow, so I'm glad to see you guys are responding in that capacity. So there's a lot of things we can be thank thankful for your health. Working at elementary school always brings you. Yep, that's exactly right. And teachers, I think, have a special dispensation of blessing for all that. And so, Lisette, thankful for a good start to the school year. And with three kids in, in elementary school, that's exactly right. So that's a that's a big one right there. Thankful for the birth of two healthy great grandsons. That's awesome. That's awesome. Two great grandsons this summer. That's pretty cool. I like that. That is some good stuff right there, people. I like that. Well, very nice. Well, I'm going to go pray for us, and then uh, I'm going to start my Bible study on 1 Corinthians, and we will get started with uh, get started with that. So, guys, would you join me as we go to the Lord and pray together? Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to be back together online. Thank you for the technology that allows us to do this. We pray, God, your blessings on all those situations that we've mentioned, whether that's Bill Burton or Bill Dancy, as we pray for people who are going back to school and all the challenges that that brings, as we think about friends who have thyroid surgery and we think about uh, friends who are we've lost and who've not survived cancer or other things. We pray, God, that you would just speak to our heart and help us to hear your voice. Father, we are thankful for the blessings that you give us and ask, God, that you would keep us mindful of hearing and seeing the blessings you give us in life. There's so much negative garbage in this world. It's easy not to see the beauty and the joy and the life and the peace that is out there. And so, God, speak to our hearts. Help us to hear your voice and line our lives up with your word. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Aish. Well, Dwayne, I'm sorry to hear that. That's a tough one. I, you know, it's really interesting. Right now with COVID, I'm hearing more and more people get COVID right now. Uh, not in our church. We're right now in our church. We've got a big lull. But um, I'm not hearing people get super sick. So that's, that's a blessing. Um, our friend Eva, who's not with us tonight, and Eva, if you're here and you just haven't checked in, uh, Eva was really, really sick um, early part of my sabbatical, and I thought we were going to lose Eva. Um, but due to COVID, but she bounced back and she is doing doing pretty well. So uh, so Dwayne, we hope and pray that uh, your buddy Guy Hall um, he'll he'll bounce back from all this. That would be that'd be a good thing. So, all right, we if you have your Bible and uh, we're going to look at First Corinthians. We're going to spend the next um, the next few weeks talking about First Corinthians. In fact. Last year, my plan was to uh, to look at, first, at look at the Gospel of John, and I didn't even finish the entire Gospel of John, and so I don't know how far we'll get in First Corinthians, but we're going to work through First Corinthians, and uh, and see what what God has to say to us in this capacity as we look at the book of of First Corinthians. If you have your Bible, you can look uh, look keep it open to First Corinthians. We're going to be looking in the first chapter today, and uh, be focusing in on that. And when we start looking at the book of 1 Corinthians, the first underlying thing that I want you to hear as we look at this entire book for the next however many weeks that we're here is that this principle and this reality, and it's very basic, it's very simple, it's very standard, is that God can make a difference in anyone's life. God can make a difference in anyone's life. And, and as we go through this text, as we go through this book, as we go look through all the chapters of 1 Corinthians, and we talk about a variety of different things from some really bad things and really hard things and really difficult things to really good things, I want you to hear very clearly that God can make a difference in anyone's life. And that's kind of an important thing to hold on to. When you think about the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, the church at Corinth, it was founded when Paul visited there in the book of Acts when he was on his second missionary journey and he spent about 18 months there in fact in Acts chapter 18 you can read about it in Acts 18 verses 1 through 17 and Paul stayed about 16 17 months 18 months and he did a lot of really really unique things we're introduced to some people that we hear throughout the New Testament Priscilla and Aquila we read about a guy by the name, um, goodness, I just lost his name, Crispus. Uh, we meet a guy by the name of Sosthenes. And we are introduced to some people that we are going to read about through the rest of the New Testament who Paul met at Corinth. When Paul went to Corinth and did his thing at Corinth, man, the people responded. Uh, people were preaching. People were giving their hearts to Christ. People were baptized. There were a lot of people who responded to the story of Jesus at Corinth. And when they did that, we saw some, some pretty cool things take place. Some significant leaders became followers of Christ, and some significant government people became followers of Christ. And it's a really, really neat start 
to the church at Corinth. Now, one of the interesting things about the church at Corinth is that Corinth was not, um, not a family-friendly destination. You did not want to take your family to Corinth. You would have much rather taken them to Disney World. Um, just to say it this way, if, if Corinth was, uh, was, was a, a trading area where sailors would port their ships on one side of the Greek, of the Greek mainland, and they would have their ship transported across land about four miles, emptying all the goods and all that thing. So they didn't have to take this very dangerous 200 mile journey around the bottom of Greece. And so it was a lot easier, easier, a lot safer to do a land portage across the isthmus. Now, when they did that, that generated a lot of business. That generated a lot of, uh, of, of people to work and generated a lot of uh, merchants and things of that nature. So Corinth became a very, very popular spot uh, economically in terms of transportation and in terms of government relations, etc., etc. Another thing that became very popular in Corinth was a, um, a temple for a lady by the name of Aphrodite. And the temple at Aphrodite at Corinth, it wasn't a real nice place. In fact, there were a thousand priests at at that temple that the way they worshipped Aphrodite was by having sex. And so these were basically prostitutes that were working at this temple. In fact, this summer when I went to Rome and we were going through part of the Vatican, there is a statue that we think came from Corinth and it's the goddess Artemis. And the, this, temp, this statue of Artemis is a statue of a woman with dozens of breasts. And, and it's kind of a symbol of, of sexuality and fertility and things of that nature. If you said that somebody was a Corinthian, that was not a, uh, a noble name. If somebody says you're a Virginian, well, there's some, some pride in that. If somebody says you're a Mexican, well, there's some pride in that. If somebody says you're from California or whatever, there's some pride in, in your home hometown, I guess. But if somebody said you were from Corinth, that wasn't the nicest compliment. In fact, that wasn't a compliment at all. It was kind of pejorative. And so when this church gets started at Corinth, it's got some real challenges. It's got some real challenges in terms of what's going on in that community, just the way it is. Now, Paul and the, and the people that, that founded that church and got things going at that church, they, they had some good leaders and they had some strong leaders and they had some new leaders and and some good things were taking place at Corinth while they were while they were doing this but Paul was there for 18 months he goes back to Jerusalem for a bit then he comes back and he goes to a city called Ephesus and while he's in Ephesus he gets a message from a lady named Chloe that there's some problems at church and there's some problems in Corinth and he learns about some moral issues and he learns about some conflicts and he learns about a, a variety of different things that are going on that, that just aren't the best. And so Paul writes this letter that we're going to be looking at for the next, uh, for the next several weeks as we, as we look at this. Because something that started off very positive turned south pretty quick. So as we get started with this, I want to talk about something kind of important, I think. Mm. If I were to ask you to name some of the churches in the old in the New Testament, excuse me, what are some names of churches in the in the New Testament that you might remember? Can you guys? I'm going to wait for three or four names. So, like the church at Corinth is one. I'll do another one. The church at uh, Laodicea. Can you think of some other churches in the New Testament that kind of pop in your mind? Maybe the church at Thessalonica. Anything, any churches pop in your mind real quick? I'll wait a couple minutes to see if anybody wants to pop anything down there. I'm not seeing as many comments tonight, and I would much rather see comments than me talking all the time, but I guess I have to ask questions for you guys to respond. So what are some churches that come from the New Testament that you think of? Any comments? There's the church at Philippi. There's the church at Galatia. Berea. Good answer, Elizabeth. I like that. That's the Bereans. That's a good word. Any others? Any others? 
there are all kinds of churches that are listed in the New Testament. Um, there are churches that you are associated with uh, the seven churches of the Revelation, uh, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis. Uh, you've got the churches that Jesus mentioned there. You've got all kinds of churches that Paul started in the book of Acts from the, the three missionary journeys, dozens of churches. And if I were to ask you which was the perfect church in the New Testament, what might pop to your mind? Hopefully, none of them. Because the reality is, there were no perfect churches in the New Testament. There weren't. If we want to talk about some really, really good churches, we could. We could talk about the church at Philippi. The church at Philippi, there you go. I don't know if that's Marlene or Chuck. But the church at Philippi, that was a great church. And Paul had a lot of very strong memories and connections with that church. But that church had some pretty serious conflict that he had to address in chapter 3. If we want to talk about the church at Thessalonica, that church had some really good people and really strong stuff. But they had some theology that was kind of messed up a little bit. If you talk about how Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, the church at Galatia, Paul just slaps them on the hand and says, you got to change. So in the New Testament, you don't find any perfect churches. You just don't. They're, they don't exist. Do you know why there are no perfect churches in the New Testament? It's because the New Testament churches were made up of people. And people are broken. We're a mess. We make mistakes and we do things that just sometimes hurt. And so part of the story of the New Testament is trying to work through this brokenness and work through all this and do the best that we possibly could. So if I were to ask you what might be your favorite church in our contemporary world and what church you might say is perfect or if there is such a thing, um, what what church might come to your mind? What church might might pop in. You heard me say a, a thousand times how much I love Saddleback Church in Southern California. So for me, Saddleback's a, a big deal. What what church for you might be a big deal or a, and some place that is really significant for you that that might be the place? Any thoughts? Any thoughts that pop to your pop in your mind? Any ideas? I'm I'm waiting for some responses now. I said Saddleback. Does anybody else have any other thing else? At some point, I'm not going to have any water, but I'm still going to pause just to give you guys a chance to write something down there. Anything? During my in-person Bible study, uh, somebody commented that the Crystal Cathedral, uh, Robert Schuler's church, was a place that just really, really had it, had it together. I, that's a good thought, but did you realize that the Crystal Cathedral closed about four years ago? It's no longer the Crystal Cathedral, that it's a, it's a Catholic church, that the Schulers don't have it anymore. Uh, we could talk about any number of churches that we think are perfect or the best, and they're not. And do you know why? It's because they're made up of people, and people are broken. As Linda wrote, we people are a mess. From the pastor on down, we are a mess. And so the goal that we have is we look at how do we grow and how do we become and how do we develop a church that's healthy and strong and vibrant and and all those things the church at Corinth gives us some some ideals and I think that's really important now if you've heard me preach that's a good one none that we've been to Marlene that's a good one if you've heard me preach you've heard me talk very longingly about my church in Buckingham I loved Mulberry Grove if you've heard me preach very long, you've heard me talk a lot about Tappahannock and Beale Memorial. I loved Beale Memorial. And my guess is, 20 years from now, when I'm a much older man and I've got less hair, wait, that's not possible. I'm going to talk very longingly and with a lot of love and affection about Manassas Baptist Church. But the reality is, every church has got some challenges. Every single one. That's just the reality does some really good things, but it's also got some challenges that, that are going on in every part of it. And that's just the reality. So Corinth, the book of Corinthians, is going to teach us some things that I think are kind of important. And the first thing that I want us to hold on to as we start this is seen in the, in the introduction to this letter. If you have your Bibles, 
and you look in chapter 1, in, in, verse, in verse 2, you see something kind of important. The Bible reads, To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. This verse is something that we read over pretty quickly, and we might not even think there's anything significant to it, but there is something very, very important in this text. A couple things that are very important. And the first thing is, when the Bible says, to those sanctified, in some translation, it calls them the sanctified, the saints. And so I want you to understand that when Paul is talking to the people who are going to the church at Corinth, or the people that are going to Manassas Baptist Church, or the people that are going to, to whatever church might be, one of the ways that Paul would identify us is to those who are sanctified in Christ, to the saints. In our Catholic tradition, our fr Catholic friends have the idea that a saint is somebody that's deceased, that somebody has done a miracle, and that's how you become a saint. And that's not biblically accurate. Biblically accurate is a saint is a person who's made a profession of faith in Christ and has made a decision that they want to follow Christ, and they are seen as sanctified saints in Christ. Not because they've done a miracle, and not because they've done anything special, but because of what Jesus did. But the second part of that that's really, really important is that they are also called to be holy. And that calling to be holy understands that not only are we positionally sanctified in Christ, but we have this continual action that God expects us to be making some wise choices, to be making some good choices. And that's that's kind of an important important thing. Karen, somebody in our Bible study in person said said Shadow Mountain. That's that's kind of neat. I like that. And so Paul goes on and he starts writing this uh, to this church at Corinth starting in verse 4. And if you've got your pen or you can underline a couple of words here that I think are important. Look what the Bible reads starting in verse 4. I always thank God for you because of his grace. If you have your pen, underline grace. Because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus, for in him you've been enriched. Would you circle enriched? Enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because of our testimony about Christ, it was confirmed. Would you circle or underline confirmed? It was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack. Would you underline you do not lack? You do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into fellowship with his son, he is faithful. Would you underline or circle faithful? That's, that's kind of important. So when we, we see this picture of what Paul is saying to this church in Corinth, he says five things pretty quick that I think are important for us to understand and, and what it looks like to, to be a part of a church that's healthy and vibrant and growing and to be a part of our, our life story when we want to be healthy and vibrant and growing is it begins with grace. It begins with the understanding that God has given us a gift that is pretty substantial. In fact, it says, I always thank God for you because of the grace given to you in Christ Jesus, for in him you have been enriched, enriched in every way. Now, I wish this meant that we were financially enriched in every way. I wish that this meant that we were physically enriched in every way, but it does not. That means that we have been given various blessings and all kinds of different blessings that come apart of knowing who he is and experiencing him. It does not mean that we've been financially blessed or that we've been physically blessed that we're not going to have any pain or hurt or heartache. That's not the case. Today, when I was with my friend Bill Burton in the hospital, and as I mentioned, Bill is, Bill is blind. But normally when I talk to Bill, his eyes are open even though he can't see me. But today, he was laying in bed and he had his eyes closed as we were talking. And we talked for a long time. Bill's 85 years old. And he said over and over again, he said, David, I have been so blessed in my life. I have been so blessed in my life. And you know, here's a guy who's in excruciating pain. And he's saying, yeah, I have been blessed in my life. And we could think about it in a variety of different ways. And my guess is, if I were to ask you to write, in fact, I am going to ask you, would you guys write down one way, one way that you've been blessed in the last week? 
Would you write down one way? Dizzy, thank you. That's good. I am blessed by your friendship as well, my friend. Would you write down one way that you've been blessed in the last week? One way you've been blessed in the last week. So we have how many people? We've got 20 people in this room right now. So I'm going to wait for seven responses. Seven responses of ways in which you've been blessed in the last week. So give me a... Give me, give me seven reasons in seven ways. Hey, Mark, it's good to see you. I'm glad to see you and your dad. I've missed you guys for the last two months, so it's good to have you. Mark, since you're coming in late, you and your dad, I'm looking for one way you've been blessed in the last, last week. So, guys, hook me up. There's 20 people in the room. I'm looking for seven responses. So let's hear it. Oh boy. Hey Maureen, safe travels. That's a good word. We're blessed with a lot of safe travels. Spending quality time with your brothers. Very nice. That was good. I like that. Very cool. Hey Linda, I like that. That's awesome. Sharing music with your son Connor. I like that. That's awesome. That's a good one. What else? Other responses? Other ways in which you've you can see God's blessings in your life? That's about five one, two, three, that's four. So I'm waiting for three more responses and how you've been blessed in the last week. So three more people. We got 20 of us in the room right now. So some three of you've got to get up and say something here. There's Joan. Hey, Johnny Thomas. Good to see you. Nice, nice, nice. I like, good to have you with us. That is excellent news. Thank you for sharing that with me. And Joan, I like that. Marlene, good pre-op EKG. Marlene, by the way, we're praying for you. Good report from your doctor. That's awesome. See, guys, when we pause for just a little bit, we can see some of the blessings that God's given us, and that's kind of important. The second thing is this word confirmed. The Bible goes on and it says, For in him you've been enriched in every way, and all you're speaking and all you're acknowledging him, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Do you know what that means? That means that, that there is something secure in your faith. That means that there is something stable. That your faith is something that is a foundational part of who you are. And that is a significant piece. That when the storms of life blow, that there is something solid that you can hold on to. It's like talking to Bill Burton when he's flat on his back because his back is broken. And he's talking about his faith and what, where God has blessed him. It's like talking to Eva a couple of weeks ago and we're praying on the phone and in the midst of her struggle that she's still holding on to that faith there's something strong there but it goes on and it says another part of this gift is that we don't lack any spiritual gift now when he says this he's writing this to the whole church so each of us as individuals we've been blessed with a variety of gifts but together, when we come together as the body of Christ, God has blessed us with all these gifts and all these abilities and all these talents that can make an impact and make a difference. And that grace gift, when it comes together in the body of Christ, it does something significant. The fourth thing that it addresses, and it doesn't use the word hope, but when it talks about the return of Christ, it's addressing the idea of hope. And the fifth piece is that God is faithful. God is is faithful my buddy trevor weaver uh, he wrote his own obituary and uh, his a friend sent it to me and i was able to read it and uh, and in, in 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 trevor's own way he wrote something like like this i guess if you're reading this cancer won but i want you to remember that i fought the good fight i ran the race and i have finished well talking about his faith in christ and the reality is god was faithful to the very end in my friend's life and my friend's story. And God's going to be faithful for you. One of the things that um, I thought a lot about when uh, I went on my sabbatical, Sam Maxwell, he said, David, as you prepare to conclude the next 10 years and, and conclude your ministry, he said, what are some things that you, you really want to leave people? What are some things that you really want people to hold on to? And for me, that fourth one that I talked about, hope, hope. I, I, I don't know where we might have lost it, but it seems like we have hope in all kinds of things that we don't need to have hope in. We have hope in our, our political leaders. We have hope that our finances are going to recover. We have hope in, in a variety of different things. And as followers of Christ, 
I think the hope that we have in Christ, it affects everything of who we are. It affects how we treat people. It affects how we engage with our family. It affects how we do our job. It affects so many things. And, and as I was thinking about this and what I want to conclude my ministry over the last 10 years, one of the things that I want to talk about a lot is where do we find our hope? What is our hope based on? If it's based on what your finances are, you might be in trouble. If it's based on your health, you might be in trouble. Is it based on the relationships you're a part of? You might have some challenges. Where are you going to find your hope? Well, Paul said to the church at Corinth that it was found in Christ. And I think that's a big, big piece. So when we look at this picture that Paul's trying to address to this church at Corinth about what it looks like to, 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 to grow a church and be a part of a church that's doing well, I think one of the parts of it is it starts with grace and understanding the gifts that God has given us through him, that we've been enriched with all these heavenly blessings, that we've been confirmed in him, that we've been gifted and not lacking in any abilities within the body of Christ, that we have hope and that he is faithful. The, the second thing that I think is kind of interesting when Paul talks to these, this community of faith at Corinth, he talks about unity. And the church at Corinth, it, it was struggling with unity. It was struggling a lot with unity. And any church that is going to do some good things in this world, it has to be a unified church. It does. And that means unified behind the purpose, unified behind the mission, unified behind the story of Jesus, unified behind the goal of whatever, whatever, whatever it might be. And when Paul says this to this church at Corinth, he's addressing the fact in verse 10 that there's some division. Look at this. Verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you, that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brother's son from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Cephas. And still another says, I follow Christ. And so when we think about this picture of unity, I want you to understand that there are going to be times that we're going to disagree with people that we go to church with. We are. We're going to have seasons when we're going to have some disagreements about politics or disagreements about policy or disagreements about whatever it might be, the color of the carpet, the color of the paint, the sound of the music, the type of music, the children's ministry, youth ministry, the pastor sermons, whatever. There are going to be times when we disagree. But the reality is, if we want to be a part of a church that's doing some pretty cool things and doing some things that are exciting, we've got to find some unity in the midst of some differences. Paul talks about four different people that people were saying they were following. They said they were following Paul, Paulos, following Cephas, Simon Peter, or Jesus. And each of those kind of symbolize a variety of different things or directions that people could have been going. And that's just, that's just the way it was. In fact, if you were to look at it in our day, that could be in a church, you could have a group of people who are following Rick Warren's theology, or a group of people who are following Billy Graham's theology, or a group of people who are following Pope John Paul's theology, or whatever the, the person might be, and they could not come together because they disagreed with the, the tertiary issues. They disagreed with the third level issues, and that was creating a problem. And Paul said, is Christ divided? No. Paul wrote, was Paul crucified? No. Paul wrote, were you baptized into the name of Paul? No, you were baptized in the name of Jesus. Jesus was the one crucified. And so part of the picture that we have to look at as we, as we deal with some challenges that, that come along is that unity, it grows when Jesus is the focus. Not the pastor, not the, the person on the stage, not that. But when Jesus is the focus, unity grows when we recognize that the bride of Christ, the church, Jesus died for that bride. Jesus is the one who gave his life for the bride to grow together and experience life together. And we are baptized not into the name of Paul or David or whoever it might be. We're baptized into the name of Jesus. And so the focus has to be for unity is that Jesus is it. 
guys, there are going to be times when, when we get sideways. And the challenge that we have is to make certain that Jesus is the focus as we try to work through these things. And when we have some pretty strong disagreements, remember, we are to be kind, we're to be merciful, and we're to be gentle. Even when we disagree, even when we disagree, we can work through some work through some hard things. And that's kind of a big deal. And I think that's important. The last thing that Paul addresses in this idea of 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 unity, excuse me, and growing a great church and being a part of this experience is that it's not just about understanding the grace gifts that he's given us, the grace that he's given us, and it's not just about the unity, but it's also about having wisdom. Look what the Bible reads. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being per who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. When you think about it, there are people in this world who multiple generations have not been involved in church. They just haven't. Their parents didn't take them. Their grandparents didn't take them. Their great-grandparents didn't take them. There are multiple generations of people who have not been involved in a faith community. That's just the truth. And when we start talking to them about forgiveness or grace or creation or uh, giving our tithes or giving our talents or giving our treasure to God, it's what are you talking about? And so part of experiencing and understanding what it looks like for us to have a, a full and abundant life is having a biblical source of wisdom. That's why we're studying the Bible tonight. That's why we have small groups. That's why when I preach, I preach biblical messages and focus in on this in a, in a pretty substantial way. It's vitally important. I, when I was on my sabbatical, not just when I'm on sabbatical, when I'm traveling, I do not tell people that I'm a pastor. I never do. And it's not that I'm ashamed of being a pastor. I am not ashamed of being a pastor. What I do not want to do is get into arguments about people, with people when I tell them I'm a pastor. Too many times I've met a stranger in my travels, and I'll tell them I'm a pastor, and they'll treat me very unpleasantly, or they'll be rude, or they'll want to have an argument, or something will happen that it's just like, I'm on vacation. I don't want to deal with this. So when I went to Maine, I stayed at an Airbnb, excuse me, I stayed at a bed and breakfast. And I was in Sullivan, Maine, and I stayed with a couple, their name are Greg and uh, Margaret. And I told them, I said, guys, I'm on my sabbatical, and all the other guests that are going to stay at your house, please don't tell I'm a pastor. Tell them I, I lead a nonprofit organization. That's the truth. I lead a nonprofit organization, and, and we talk about what, and I talk to them about a variety of different things. So whenever I would meet the couples that stayed at the bed and breakfast, I didn't have to argue with them or, or get into long conversations if they didn't like the church or whatever, and didn't have to do that. So it just made things kind of nice. One morning, I met a couple, uh, Steve and Patricia, I believe, and they were from Chicago and had a nice conversation with Steve and Patricia. Suzanne, Suzanne, and uh, and the next morning, Steve and I are having breakfast, and he's wearing a cancer survivor bracelet, and he knows that I lead a nonprofit organization in Northern Virginia, but that's it, and so we're talking and having a good breakfast, and uh, at some point, I ask him about uh, about his bracelet, and uh, and Steve said, I said, are you a cancer survivor? And Steve didn't say anything, but he just kind of used his head and did this. He kind of pointed to the empty chair with his head. Didn't point, didn't say his wife, didn't do anything. He just let me know it was her. And I said, so your wife has cancer? Wouldn't answer. And I said, what kind of cancer? And then all he said was pancreatic. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I said, how long has she been sick? And he said, three years. So he's barely talking. He'd been a bubbling brook up until this point. Now it's just one word answers. And I could tell he's getting tears in his eyes. And I said, how long has she been sick? And he said, three years. And when, I, when he said that, man, poof, tears started flowing, snot started running, emotions just came unchecked, and it was good. It was just he and I at the breakfast table. So we're talking, and he's crying, and he's sobbing, and Margaret sees him upset from the other room, and she walks in and hands him a handkerchief. And, I mean, it's, it's very emotional. And we talk, we pray, we do whatever. And when he's finally collecting himself, he looked at me, and he said, are you a pastor? And I said, 
yes, I am. And we got to talking and laughing about that. But there are times when you talk about some deep things that if you share that, it's foolishness. Because people just don't want to hear it. It just is. And so when you're talking to people, I think we've got to be be careful how we do that. At least I am in, uh, in those conversations. It's fascinating to me. Fascinating to me. That when you listen to people, the things they will tell you. And when you listen, sometimes you have the opportunity to share the story of Jesus in some profound ways. I've got a lot of other stories I could tell you from my experience on sabbatical, but it's really important for us to understand that the message of the cross, it's a different message these days. It just is. And so how do we, how do we live a life that's full and abundant? I think we have to have the wisdom of the Bible and the story of Jesus in our hearts and our souls. All right, guys, that's my that's my study on 1 Corinthians. I'm very glad that you could be with us tonight. I'm glad to see folks joining with us again as we get back together. We had uh, 22 people here with us tonight, so it's awfully good to see you. And I'm glad to be back with you. It's about 8.15, so I'm going to shut her down and get ready to go home for the evening. I'm looking forward to preaching on Sunday and uh, and sharing. For I, I told Becky Verner I've got my sermons lined up through the through Easter. And so I'm excited about sharing and engaging with the congregation. I hope if you're in Manassas, you can join with us and be a part of that. Looking forward to seeing you. Looking forward to seeing my favorite back row Baptist people, uh, Liz and Lisette. And so hoping to see you guys on Sunday. And, uh, and I'm glad to, glad to see you. Jerry and Linda, good to have you with us. Give Kennedy a, a hug for me. And so it's good to have you guys all with us today. So have a good night. Have a great day at school tomorrow if you've got kids going to school. Kurt West, good to have you with us, my man. Kurt West is one of my friends from Southern Illinois. So very cool. Maureen, thank you. Give your husband a big hug from me. He's been a blessing. Russell, good to see you. Dizzy, see you tomorrow, buddy. Look forward to see you on the skeet field. Liz, see you tomorrow, or see you Sunday, rather. Tomorrow's Thursday. So good to have you with us. Joan Squires, I have missed you. I'm going to give you a big hug when I see you and I shake Morgan's hand. Don and Edna, good to have you with us tonight. Thank you for joining with us. Good to have you guys with us tonight. I don't know who else was in the room, but I'm Marlene and Chuck, nice to have you. Marlene, I had such a wonderful time with your friend in Cooperstown. She was just a lovely lady, and she thinks the world of you. So uh, she's looking forward to you guys going up there and seeing her. Oh, and Marlene, I got a package, and I think your husband sent this to me. Keep the faith from Padre. I love it. So I'm looking forward to wearing that. Tell Chuck I got the shirt. And I appreciate that, and I will be uh, be doing that. Nancy, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, Maureen. That's much appreciated. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to shut her down. Thank you for being with us. Debbie Hepburn, good to see you. Mark Facemeyer, tell your dad I said hello. Nice to have you with us, old buddy. All right, I'm going to turn her off, and you guys have yourself a great evening. See you now. <laughs>